So welcome everyone to our Routing Switch and Essentials and Instructor Training Class for the week of 3-12-18. And we're going to talk about switched networks because this is routing and switching essentials. So we talked about routing, router rip. We talked about the basics of the routing table. Now we're going to look at how a switch works and get into uh, the nitty gritty of a switch. Now, one of the things that we see is that networks are definitely becoming more complex. And in fact, as we talked about earlier in this class, trying to decide what switch to buy, um, everything from PoE to, um, you know, power of Ethernet. Do we need to support power of Ethernet? How many ports do we need? What do we need the back plane speed to be? How are we going to support the Internet of Things? You know, we've gone from, we've got small switches, big switches. Really, we've got a plethora of items being put onto our networks. In fact, I can get Somebody just, I had a little Netgear switch in my office, and I had my PC and my um, phone connected to it, but it was a 100 megabit switch. And we were trying to do the whiteboard software through my phone, uh, or through my uh, PC, and we're like, man, there's a lot of lag. And I did a test uh, at Fast.com, and maybe one of you told me about it, and uh, I found out that I was only getting like something like 80 megabits per second. Well, I put this little uh, it's basically, really honestly, a 100 megabit, uh, or excuse me, a gigabit pass-through with uh, PoE pass-through also, and the IT department gave it to me, it's a little Netgear pass-through, and look at my speed now that I've got going to our network. So now I'm at 400 megabits per second. Uh, man, I wish I had this at home. Um, but that gives me, basically I went from 80 megabits a second because I was on a 100 megabit switch to 400 megabits per second or faster, just depending on what I've got going on. Of course, obviously I got, I'm sitting here yapping across this, but still 400 megabits per second is nothing to sneeze at uh, on a gigabit link. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, but that's some of the things you got to think about. You know, how are you going to support, for instance, in my, in my office, there's only one port in the wall that's hot. And we've got to support my PC. We've got to support my phone. We've got to support my extra cable that I run over here to all kind of stuff. So how do we do that? And really for our network, we didn't do a good job thinking about that because we didn't put enough network ports in the offices. And the result is we have these little devices in our in our offices. And we've also got this, this converge network now. We got voice, video, and data all on the same network. You know, our IP cameras now, or excuse me, our uh, surveillance cameras are IP cameras. They're not on a separate network that we need to use. Uh, a different network. So, oops. And this uh, beep, 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 that was your marketing warning. Um, here's the Cisco borderless network. Uh, please buy our stuff. Um, so they kind of give you an idea of what they want you to do to build out the network to what Cisco says. Now, I will tell you this. All joking aside, um, Cisco's integration with their collaboration tools. Uh, one of the neat things you can do, and I've seen it multiple times, is actually have, um, you know, if you have their their telephony, Bush over IP telephony system, you can literally just click on a thing and say, hey, I'm out of the office, forward all my calls to my phone, to my to my cell phone, and they will actually ring on your phone. Um, back in the day when we had a Cisco system here, which I still wish we had, I was able to pull up a uh, connect via VPN from anywhere I was at pull up the phone and dial my house and it would be like calling from my office. So really pretty cool stuff. Um, and that was a truly borderless network. We're back to what we see here, folks, our core distribution and access layer. Uh, the ability, if we do this and use a modular design, we can replace individual pieces so we could replace the access layer with a new access layer. Just like we now have 4321 routers, we could replace that or if we decide to buy a different type of distribution layer switch, say a 9000 um, or whatever, you could do that. Um, it's hierarchical, so you can build redundancy into it. I'll tell you this, if you built this network, it's going to cost you some money um, because you can see you've got redundancy at each layer. Um, so it's one of those things you got to be careful with. Here's the class core we talked about where, let's say you don't have the money to do a full core distribution and access layer set up. You do a core distribution class core, and then you have an access layer. But you're always going to have an access layer because you've got to have a way for your devices to come into the network, and that's what the access layer is for. The access layer can do port security, 
Um, we can do uh, usually uh, the access layer switches are high density switches, meaning they have a large number of ports on them. And they don't even have to be separate switches. In today's um, networks, many times the access layer is a set of blades that slide into a larger chassis. Okay. And in some ways that's kind of a kind of a collapsed distribution slash um, access layer. The distribution layer though, folks, that's where we're doing our aggregating. Uh, so where we're going to do uh, layer two broadcast domains and layer three routing boundaries, um, high availability through redundant links to the access layer switches and to the core switches. And then at the core layer, it's high speed, no drag. We really want the core layer to be as fast as possible. So we try not to implement too many um, security policies there. It's the aggregator for all of our network blocks, and it will eventually put everything out of the network into onto the internet. And this really is the collapsed core distribution with the access. Any questions on core distribution and access layers? None? Okay. So in switch networks, what do we need to do? Now, we had years ago, they talk about these flat layer two networks. In other words, in the old days, all of this would be one big flat layer two network. There wouldn't be any uh, VLANs on it. You'd have all these hosts be on the same IP addresses. Of course, this is a multi-layer switch, so we don't do that anymore. What we now do is instead of a flat two-layer network, we've got a hierarchical network design where we will actually block things off based upon VLANs and based upon different subnets. So we'll subnet this network out so that each one of these could possibly be on a separate subnet, or they're going to be on subnets based upon what they're actually used for. So this may be, you know, a marketing person, and over here in another building, this could be a marketing person, or on another floor, and they will be in the same VLAN. May not be, depending on how the network is set up. This could be a routed network. So it all depends on how you set your network up. The switches that we buy, um, when we look at form factors, we do have what are called fixed configurations like these, which is the standard 2960 we have in our classroom. Um, when you look at these and you decide how you're going to buy the, a switch, you're going to look at your cost, obviously, because cost is a very important item. You look at port density, how many ports do you need? Uh, always remember that computers are like rabbits. You got five today and 25 tomorrow. Um, so plan for growth. Power, do you need PoE? Uh, are you going to be running IP phones? Are you going to be running access points? Because wireless access points are easy to set up with PoE, and that makes it to where you don't have to have um, a power connector near that particular item or near the access point. How reliable are they? What are the port speeds? Also, what are the backplane speeds? Not just the port speed. Port speed's important, but is the backplane able to handle the actual port speeds? Is it true wire speed routing? In other words, if there are 24 gigabit ports, does the backplane support 24 gigabits per second? That is something very, that's what you need to look and say, are we comparing apples and apples? A lot of people look at a Cisco switch and go, God, that's expensive. They'll look at the backplane speed and see that it is true wire speed switching. You look at a cheaper switch and it may have 24 gigabit ports and support 20 gigabit per second on the backplane. So you can't use all the ports at their full speed. However, guess what? Go back to this cost. You may decide that your speed, that, that particular performance is okay for your network and use that for the cost. So, you know, uh, it doesn't have to match that, but it is very important that you look at that. So it's comparing apples and apples. Stackable configuration switches here are switches you can slide blades into. Okay. So they're chassis that accept blades. Most of these chassis have redundant power supplies, redundant supervisor engines, so that you can have uh, greater fault tolerance. And then this is what's called stackable or stack-wise technology. These are switches that you can actually put these special stack cables on, and all of these actually appear to be one single backplane. You'll learn um, down the road, maybe, if you get into Nexus switching, they also have a thing called FX, which is basically an extender that allows you to connect additional um, ports to a, um, to a Nexus switch, and it appears to be as 
if it's connected or internal to that switch. So LAN switches. We, we know a good amount about LAN switches. We know that, tell me something, I'm gonna ask you a question. What do switches filter by? Typical switches. Anybody? MAC address. Somebody just said it. They filter by MAC address. MAC addresses. Okay. Which are layer two addresses, right? These are layer two addresses. Also know what's another name for a MAC address? What kind of address is it? Uh, physical address. Physical address, correct. It's a physical address versus a logical address, which is IP address. So remember, data link layer is uh, layer two, and it consists of two sublayers, the LLC and MAC. Well, on a LAN switch, by default, the MAC address table is empty. So when you first boot up a switch, there's nothing inside of the, LAN, the table. It has to learn by looking at the source MAC addresses on frames coming in. So it has to learn that and then place that into the table. Now, once it does that, so once it learns all the different port, ports and their associated MAC addresses, by the way, they, they took and just simplified the MAC addresses here. That's not a true MAC address. But once a switch learns all the MAC addresses on its ports, it can send frames from one port to another port. So it can come from an ingress port. It'll ingress check the MAC address table, and then egress. By default though, when you first boot one up, guess what? It actually will, once it comes in, a frame comes in, by default at the beginning, it's actually sent out all ports except for the port it came in on so that it can find the destination. That's before the MAC address table is built. This is a good little video, I'm not sure you can watch it yourself, but it basically is going through exactly what I'm talking about, is how you can go in and it learns the, the MAC address table, which is also called the CAM table, Content Addressable Memory Table, learns all of the addresses on the ports by looking at the source MAC addresses that come in the frame. Now, a switch has to have a method of sending information from an ingress port to an egress port. So ingress coming in, egress going out. One of those methods that are used is called store and forward, all right? Store and forward takes in the entire frame, runs the CRC again, checks it to make sure the CRC is okay. It basically, it proves that the frame has not been damaged from the source getting to the switch. Then does the switch table look up and sends it out. Now the good thing about store and forward is the switch is never going to send a damaged frame out to a destination host. Okay. Now it could get damaged between the leaving the egress port and getting to the destination. But with store and forward, when it comes in and is checked, it is going to leave the switch and that's going to be a valid frame. Now, it used to be that this was a method that took a large amount of uh, horsepower, and it still takes more than the other methods we're going to talk about. But many different switches now use store and forward as their default method. All right? Good method because, again, you will never send a frame that has been damaged. A different method that is also available is called cut through. And what it does is it, a cut through switch, will look at the frame up to, depending on how, how cut, there's two different, really different, two different types of uh, cut through. There's one that just looks at the destination frame MAC address and then starts sending it. There's another version of cut through called fragment free that actually takes in the first 64 bytes. And if all of that comes in okay, by, by definition, as long as you follow ethernet rules, you can't have a frame that's been damaged because you basically have gone past the size of a rut. So there's no collision. But basically cut through takes in a portion of the frame. A minimum is the 48 uh, bytes of the destination address, which is the destination MAC address, and then it starts sending it faster. But there is the remote possibility with cut through that you could send a frame that actually is uh, not 
uh, integrity has not been checked and has been damaged from the destination to the ingress port. Very rare that it's damaged. So cut through is also a good method. Now let's see, there's a, there's a page that shows you storing forward and talks about it. And then there's another page that talks about the fact that storing forward does error checking and checks the checksum. You've seen it twice, you're probably gonna see it again. So you, that tells you something. Just give me a heads up. Um, storing forward is Cisco's primary land switching method. All right, so uh, it is storing forward is used because simply now with ASICs and other techniques, they're able to make that work. Folks, I gotta pause the recording for. Okay, so um, storing forward takes the entire frame in, runs the CRC against it, CRC matches, and the frame has not been damaged coming in. Uh, it will then be sent out to the destination. Cut through, takes in the first portion up to the destination MAC address and then starts forwarding it automatically. Um, again, there is another type of, it's really a, a variant of, of cut through called fragment free, which waits for the 64 bytes to pass before forwarding the frame. And anything bigger than 64 bytes should be, should not be a collision. So they send that through. Um, it's really cut through and fragment free. They're better for high performance computing where you've got uh, super, super uh, high demands for low latency. So again, I think, let's see, uh, one, two, three, plus a an item, okay? How about this, buffers the entire frames that's been received by the switch. Storing forward, right? Mm -hmm. Checks the frame for errors for releasing out switch ports. If the full frame was not received, the switch discards it. Which one is that? The first one. Storing forward. Storing forward. No error checking on frames is performed by the switch before releasing the frame out of its ports. Cut through. Cut through. A great method to conserve bandwidth on your network. Cut. Cut through. Okay. Destination NIC card discards any incomplete frames using this frame forwarding method. Should be storing forward. The faster method, but may produce errors in data integrity. Therefore, more bandwidth may be consumed. Um, cut through. The other one, the, um, the third one is store for it because. That one, correct. Yeah. Yep. Because, it's because like, you don't, yeah. That's, that's why I was kind of letting you see it. This is actually a better because guess what? You don't have, I can't check it. Um, yeah. you don't, you don't have any retransmissions. You know, you don't have to worry about it. It's, it you know when it's sent, it is complete. So, so a couple pages there. Now, I love, absolutely love this. I hope it's going to, let's see if it's going to work for me. Um, yep, okay, good. All right. I love this activity. I love the way this thing works. So let's look at a switch here. So we're going to look, we're going to look at how it forwards this based on the source MAC and destination. We're going to look right here at the frame. We see the source and destination, and then we look at the MAC address table below there. And the question is, where will the switch forward this frame? So let's look at it. The destination MAC is 0C. Source MAC is 0B. And so we're going to look here and look at our table, okay? And we're going to say, where will this switch forward the frame? Does the switch have zero C's MAC um, address in its table? That's, that's Ethernet yeah. port 5. Okay, so it's going to forward it just to FA5, right? Mm-hmm. Now, when the switch forwards the frame, which statement is true? The first one is true because it does not have zero B in the MAC address table. So it's Correct. Going to add it. So it's going to add that into FA3. Is it a broadcast frame? No. No, because it's not all S. It's a unicast frame that's sent on a specific port. Is that true? Yes. Okay, that's true. Unicast frames are not flooded to all ports unless what? Unless it does not have that MAC address in the table. And it says frame is a unicast frame will be dropped by the, at the switch. That's not going to happen. So that one is correct. Now, the good thing about this particular thing is you can just click and get a new problem as many times as you want. So let's look at this one. I like this one. Destination MAC is all S. Source MAC is 0B. 
So where will the frame, where will the switch forward the frame? All ports. Port one. Okay, you had to be, All yeah, you had to be careful here. Penny, you're, you're right. Except the inverse port. That's port five. Sure. Okay, so FA1. FA5. Seven. FA7. Seven, and nine. And nine. Because it's only going to forward it out the port so there's something connected to it. If the port's not up, it's not going to forward it out. Some people make the mistake of clicking all of them, but if the port has nothing in it, it won't forward it. Okay. Now let's see. The switch adds the source mic to the mic address table. Yeah, that is true. And all Fs is a broadcast frame, right? Yes. Check. There you go. And this, the great thing for this for your students, they can keep doing new problems. And just look at how the, the table works. And it keeps adding things, which I really like, okay? So this is something very important to understand. And remember too, if it's if the table is completely blank and something came in, it would have to flood it out all ports to set the port it came in on, okay? So, collision domains. Collision domains are the area within which collisions can occur. Now, modern networks, we really should not have any collisions, to be quite honest with you. Um, we should be running full duplex. I know it talks about doing uh, a negotiation, auto negotiation. I hate auto negotiation. Um, on your switch ports, I would really set it to um, duplex full, speed 1000, or whatever you want it to be. Uh, the only thing that may have a problem with that is some old printers, or um, we have a couple of fax machines that are connected to the network, and they can cause problems. But we actually had to put in a special, uh, like an analog to digital converter. So, um, but full duplex, and when we talk about, well, first off, let me ask this. Do y'all remember these terms? What is, talk about different methods. What is simplex? Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. What is it? It's, it's um, simplex to shape a transmission, so it's like one way. One way transmission, exactly. One way transmission only. All right. What is duplex? Both ways. What is half, well, excuse me, what is half duplex? It's like a walkie talkie. You can do either send or receive, but not simultaneously. Exactly. Either send or receive. If you remember my example, I've always do uh, I before E except after uh, either. Receive or send only. I think I spelled that right. Uh, I use the Mount Everest example. Base camp, the camp two over. I got a cool, I, this is something really, really cool. I actually got a, uh, got an offer today to go the summer of 2012 and hike to the base camp uh, of Mount Everest. Um, and so hopefully, I, I'm doing it. I don't you know if I can do it. If there's any way physically I can pull it off. Uh, I'm gonna try my best to do it. And I've always, I've always, one of my life goals was to climb Mount Everest. It'll probably never happen now, but I always wanted to. And then full duplex is you can send and receive at the same time. Okay, so we try to live in a full duplex world because we want to be able to send and receive. Basically, we have our um, one side send being connected to the other side receive and vice versa. In the old days, we didn't have full duplex. We had all kinds of problems with possible collisions. Today, we really should not have any collisions. Now, a collision domain and a broadcast domain are not necessarily the same thing. Okay, they can be. All right. So a single, a series of switches together can all be, it's one broadcast domain. So in other words, this is all one broadcast domain on the switch, but it's five different collision domains. Same thing here. This is one big collision domain, but it happens to have five, 10, 11 collision domains because of the way switches work. So when you get a broadcast on a switch, it gets forwarded out every port except for the one it came in on. So it switches one big broadcast domain, but it can be multiple collision domains. Now, this is assuming, big assumption, there are no VLANs. Okay. So we're going to assume there are no VLANs here, and therefore it's a flat layer two network. It's one big broadcast domain. 
how can we alleviate a congested network? Well, one thing we need to do is think about um, high speed, low drag switches. In other words, switches that have high port density, but very fast internal switching capabilities. Large frame buffers, so that you, when you do store and forward, you can store multiple switches, uh, excuse me, multiple frames and do CRCs on them at a time and try to find out the cost per port. Now, I have a lot of trouble with this. Uh, this is where I need my, this would be very cool with my uh, um, smart board. When it says here, draw the individual shapes around each broadcast domain. Well, these are hubs. So this is one big broadcast domain that's not working. Okay. I'm having trouble with Chrome and Flash. I might start, believe it or not, using Internet Explorer or Reload Flash. Cannot wait to get rid of Flash too. But each one of these, let me ask this, how many broadcast domains you got in this? Just one. Just one. Just one. How, many, how many collision domains you got? Mm, one. Also one, because remember, hubs do nothing for either one. They're just big repeaters. How about here? How many broadcast domains you got? One. Still got one. How many collision domains you got? One. Still okay. one. Yep, still one. All right, now, how many broadcast domains you got? Um, just one. Just one. How many collision domains? One, two, three. Three, correct. Each port on the switch is a collision domain. All right, how about here? How many broadcast domains? One. One. How many collision domains? One, two, three, four, five, seven. Yes, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Correct. So there's seven different collision domains. All right. Now, we're here. How many broadcast domains? For the whole topology, just one? No, no. What? Do it the way it's shown because they're not connected to each other. Three. Three. There's three broadcast domains. There's one oh, on this switch, there's one on this switch, and there's one on this router. How many collision domains are there? Four. Could you say four? Yeah. Four is correct. There's one, two, three, four. And it's still a collision domain because it's connected directly to the to the server there. Very good. So. All right, how about this? This one's weird here. How many broadcast domains? Seven. Broadcast domains, not collision, broadcast. Does this mean that they're all connecting? They're just, all connected now. Just, I just see one. Two. I mean two with the um, server thing. There's one on each side of the router. So here's here's a broadcast domain, and here is a broadcast domain. All right. How many collision domains? Two, two, I heard seven, but it's actually five. One, yeah. two, three, four, and then this shared link right here would be five. This is like old school uh, thin net, ethernet, when we're doing, would run it with, with taps and all. Um, not something you'd see a whole lot of, but that's what they drew there. So you have to consider that would be, the correct answer would be five. And this really changes uh, just a little bit. Still got uh, one broadcast domain. And then you've got one, two, three collision domains. Because remember, this, this hub right here would put all these on the same network as that. So you'd have three collision domains and one big broadcast domain because of the switches. And no real difference there, so same thing. They're just doing collision domains and say broadcast and then collision. So they're getting the same thing twice. So collision domains, so they got them broken up. Questions about the basics of how switches work. Nope. That's it. That's chapter four, folks. Um, mm -hmm. We got a little time here. If y'all want to go ahead and kind of blow through the switch configuration, I don't think it's going to take. Actually, I think I'll wait because we got so much stuff to do. I don't want y'all to get get too much. Any questions about that chapter?
really this chapter is not going to be anything big for you because you know how to you know how to work a switch you know how to do basic switch management with SPIs. we've done that in chapter one but we will come back to this any you have any problems with the labs any issues i do know for a fact that lab um that pod three i believe it is has been having some trouble with switch two uh we'll try our best to get that fixed for you um it basically has a password on it that we can't figure out and it's intermittent it's like it will work and then suddenly to get a password on it and we're trying our best to figure out what it is so i'm gonna stop sharing my desktop stop my recording <laughs>